On Wednesday evening, I stood before those who were gathered here and said, What a day. What a day it had been, and I failed to go far enough in explaining myself concerning those matters. On Wednesday, I received six pieces of communication from others, and all six of them related to me bad news. One told of the breakdown of a marriage, the breakdown of a home, more specifically. There's going to be a divorce because of that situation. Things could not be reconciled. Things could not be worked out. Another was due to the death of an individual, and I received communication of it. The other four related to health or to physical ability of some. It left me saying, what a day. What a day it had been. Nothing but bad news. Sometimes that's the way life seems to be for us. We receive nothing but bad news. And the more we strive to look for the good in things, the more we find ourselves focusing upon the negatives. So tonight I want to discuss some things with you, some practical things that will help us as we consider the many struggles which we humans face that we simply cannot shake. These struggles surge over us, and when a similar scenario plays out in our lives or in the lives of others, those emotions, those feelings, those thoughts come roaring back. Such struggles make certain parts of the year more difficult to deal with than others. Our struggles can even make certain situations very uncomfortable, causing some to avoid those situations. Dealing with loss can affect our behavior, our health, our mood, our thinking, and even our salvation. Here are some things that should be considered when dealing with loss. First, I would suggest that everyone faces loss. We know that truth. We know that fact because it's so rampant. It's everywhere around us. Yet, when we are facing loss, we somehow seem to forget it. It's not intended to downplay anyone's struggle. The fact that everyone faces loss simply reminds us that we are not alone. Others face the same thing. And it's normal for us to experience loss and to feel out of touch with things while dealing with loss. And everyone has the potential to struggle with loss. Your struggle is unique to you. The experience of loss comes in many forms and numerous variations of those forms. A loss of relationship or friendship is handled differently based on the type of relationship, based on the closeness in the relationship, and based on what is now missing for the person left to deal with the loss. Loss of health or physical ability can affect people differently based upon their age or situation in life. Losses in the financial compartment, loss of job, a loss of financial stability, or loss of retirement might tear one person down and another is able to continue on as if it's nothing more than a minor setback. The realization that a cherished dream is out of reach can be devastating to one and yet cause another to dream another dream. Dream an even bigger dream. One loss can sometimes lead to another loss, such as when a person has lost a loved one, and they begin to struggle with that loss. They struggle with their faith, and then ultimately they give up on their faith. Seeing these things and any other losses in our lives or in the lives of others can cause us to struggle. We see several of these losses in Scripture. Many dealt with the loss of loved ones. In Genesis chapter 23 and verse 2, Abraham mourned and wept over Sarah's death. 
Jacob mourned for his sons many days. Genesis 37 verse 34. Do you remember what Naomi had to say concerning her somewhat frustration after she had lost her husband and two sons? Naomi said in Ruth chapter 1 and verse number 21, I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has witnessed against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? David's son by Uriah's wife was sick upon birth, lived seven days, and on the seventh day he died. In 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse number 20, the Bible tells us what David did upon hearing the news that this son had died. So David arose from the ground, washed, anointed himself, and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house. And when he requested, they set food before him and he ate. Ezekiel was instructed to groan silently when his wife died. Ezekiel chapter 24, verses 15 through 18. It was going to be used by God to teach a lesson to God's people. But many faced the loss of those they loved. Job felt annihilated, or rather alienated, I should say, by his friends and his family. He spoke of such in Job chapter 19, verses 13 through 22. A lengthy statement of Job's. Job struggled with a loss of a sense of dignity in his own life because of what he faced. Job chapter 30 and verse 15. David himself spoke of the loss of health in Psalm 31, verses 9 and 10. And again in the very next Psalm, Psalm 32, verses 3 and 4. Psalm 102 mentions the loss of one's reputation, verse 8 of Psalm 102. You remember Nebuchadnezzar when he faced the loss of power in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 31. He received a message from God that his kingdom would be taken from him. There was that unrighteous steward in Luke chapter 16 verses 1 through 3 of which the master said, because of your dealings as a steward, I will take it from you. He spoke of his employment. He was going to cast him out. He would no longer have a job. Way back in Exodus chapter 21 and verse number 19, some guidelines are given for two individuals if they are fighting with one another and one of them happens to strike the other with a stone or with a fist so that the one who is injured loses time. We think of time away from work. Loses time. God implemented a means, a guideline for how that is to be dealt with. Grief. Grief is an emotional and physical reaction to any traumatic or stressful loss. And the fact is, everyone faces loss. So how do we deal with loss? How do we view loss? Do we view it, deal with it as being the victim or being a victor? Good intentions and well-meant words dissipate into thin air, and after a few weeks of our loss, we're left with a lot of empty promises. Oh, they're well-intended, but they're empty promises. They never come to fruition. Psychiatrist and author Elizabeth Kubler-Ross listed five stages experienced by the terminally ill patients in her book, On Death and Dying, written in 1969. These five stages have been used in addressing several different counseling needs and grief over loss being one of them. Here are the five stages. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. 
Now these stages are not meant to be viewed as a set of steps based upon each step coming only when the previous step has been completed. A person may experience some of these, most of these, all of these, or only one of these steps in their grieving process. Everyone must eventually experience some degree of acceptance in order to move forward following a loss. Dealing with a loss as a victor is the biblical way of handling loss. The one thing that a person dealing with loss can control is how he or she reacts to the loss how they respond to it. The Bible encourages us to take control, take charge of our reaction to the loss. Acknowledge the pain. When you experience it, acknowledge it. Accept the grief. Accept the fact that grief does trigger many different and unexpected emotions. Face your feelings. Whatever emotions or feelings may come because of your loss, experience them. Go through them. Don't deny them. Express your feelings. Express them in tangible and creative ways. Writing is often a good, tangible and creative way that helps greatly. Scrapbooking can help one replay great memories. Getting involved in the things of which that one, if it's a person you have lost, happened to love, can be therapeutic as well. Whatever the case, express your feelings. Find a way to do it tangibly. Try to maintain your hobbies. Maintain your hobbies and maintain your interests. Routines often bring comfort, and in time of loss, they can provide a sense of direction. You might consider it that you would be on autopilot if you were following a routine. Sometimes that routine and that autopilot state may be needed to help get the sense of direction back. And being active brings many, many joys. Be as active as possible. Don't allow anyone to tell you how to feel, and don't tell yourself how to feel either. We coach ourselves up for failure sometimes, talking to ourselves and telling ourselves that we're better than this, we shouldn't cry before others, we shouldn't do this or shouldn't do that, or we should do this and should do that. And the reality is, sometimes we just need to be a mess for a while. Everyone wants to relate their story of grief to someone else and some specific, special connection be made. Oftentimes, this connection is simply not a reality. Remember, your grieving is your own grieving. Your loss is unique to you. Similarities may abound, but no two situations are identical to one another. Seek out face-to-face -face support from people, people who care about you. As you seek out that face-to-face -face support, you'll be around people, and comfort comes from people. Support yourself emotionally and do so specifically by taking care of yourself physically. Follow good health practices. Eat right, exercise as you can. A healthy mind and a healthy body can aid you in your coping skills and plan ahead. Plan ahead for grief triggers anniversaries, holidays, and the milestones in life and career will bring an emotional wallop. Plan for triggers. Plan for new changes. Make adjustments to your usual course of action, but don't avoid such celebrations. 
avoiding celebrations, harden those thoughts and ideas. Celebrate as best you can. And if you can't, don't give up on it. Continue to work. Make changes as needed, but plan for the triggers. Above all, choose to be a victor. Take control of your actions and your reaction to the people and the things that have brought hurt to your life. In Romans chapter 5, in verse 30, or verses 3 through 5, Paul had some very interesting things to say about this idea of choosing to be the victor. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 3. And not only this, but we also exult or rejoice in our tribulations. Why? Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. What are you saying, Paul? Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Focus on the God-given things. The God-given things such as perseverance, which could be understood as endurance or patience. Focus upon one's proven character, that is, being approved by God. And focus upon hope. The hope we have in Christ. The hope we have that's given to us by God through His Spirit. When we focus on these things, we can be victorious because the victory's been won. Deal with any loss as a victor rather than a victim. And as you choose to be a victor, I want to encourage you to face loss in the biblical way. The Bible instructs us to not just deal with loss. You may have heard that in your time of loss. Someone said, just deal with it. Sometimes you got to grit your teeth and bear it. The Bible specifically instructs us to face it and to face it with an understanding that grief brings wisdom. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse number 4. The mind of the wise is in the house of mourning. The mind of fools is in the house of pleasure. Understand that grief, mourning, can bring wisdom to us. Face loss with the confidence that God is near. Psalm 46, in verse number 1, the psalmist wrote, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. In Psalm 147, in verse number 3, the psalmist there wrote, He heals the brokenhearted, And he binds up their wounds. Face loss with confidence that God is near and God wants to help. Face loss knowing that comfort can be found. You remember what what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, which Matthew recorded in chapter 5? This is verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. God wants to comfort you in your time of loss. Face loss knowing you can find comfort. When facing loss and grieving over a loss, pray. Pray early, pray often. Pray in every step of the process of grieving. If you're in denial, maybe you should consider Psalm 55, verses 4 through 7. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me, and horror has overwhelmed me. I said, Oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Behold, I would wander far away. I would lodge in the wilderness. 
find comfort in knowing that even those of God's people often felt and were in experiencing denial. And when you feel anger, listen to the words of Job in Job chapter 7, beginning in verse 11. Therefore I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Am I the sea or the sea monster that you set a guard over me? If I say my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease my complaint, then you frighten me with dreams and terrify my visions so that my soul would choose suffocation, death rather than my pains. I waste away, I will not live forever. Leave me alone for my days are but breath. What is man that you magnify him and you are concerned about him? that you examine him every morning and try him every moment. Will you never turn your gaze away from me, nor let me alone until I swallow my spittle? Have I sinned? What have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you set me as your target so that I am a burden to myself? Why then do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? And now I will lie down in the dust and you will seek me but will not be. If you're facing moments of despair and feel depressed, maybe you should consider the words of Psalm 69. Verses 1 through 3, Save me, O God, for the waters have threatened my life. I have sunk in deep mire and there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and a flood overflows me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is parched. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Skipping down to verse 13, But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, at an acceptable time, O God, in the greatness of your loving kindness, answer me with your saving trust. Deliver me from the mire and do not let me sink. May I be delivered from my foes and from the deep waters. May the floods of water not overflow me, nor the deep swallow me up, nor the pit shut its mouth on me. Answer me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is good. According to your greatness of your compassion, turn to me. And do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Answer me quickly. And when you finally move to that period of time in which you can rejoice, maybe rejoice as Habakkuk. In Habakkuk chapter 3, beginning in verse 17. Though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olives should fail and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and He has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk on high places. As you face loss, accept the comfort which comes from God. Accept that comfort because God gives comfort and sometimes He gives it through others. Healing comes gradually, whether it takes weeks, months, years, or even decades. Allow the process to unfold. As the process unfolds, receive the comfort that God gives, as Paul spoke of it in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3 and reading through verse 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. 
As the process unfolds, receive the comfort which comes through others. Job's friends were of great comfort to him when they first came. That is, until they spoke in Job chapter 2. Many Jews went to comfort Martha and Mary after the death of their brother, John eleven twenty nine 29 records, or John eleven nineteen. 19. The church in Antioch sent relief or comfort to the brethren living in Judea, Acts chapter 11, verses 28 through 29. Whatever the loss is, God will give you comfort and God may send you comfort through other people. Face loss the biblical way. By facing it, praying all the way through it, and accepting the comfort which comes from God and is often delivered through people. Then comes the time for you to help those who are grieving. In time, a person who has dealt with a loss should be able to comfort others who are grieving. When you help others who are grieving, offer tangible help. That is, give them help by offering exactly what you intend to do. It's well-meaning to say, if there's anything I can do to help, let it me know. That's well-intended but oftentimes it ends up in an empty promise. How, more, how many more times do you make the same offer? How genuine is the offer when it's extended multiple times? How well is it intended six weeks, six months, a year after the loss has been dealt with and the same person is going through the same emotions, same feelings, and really needing that level of help which you offered. Tell the person what you are offering to help them with. Be as specific as possible. I would like to be a set of extra hands to help you around the house. I would like to come by and sit up things for you this morning. I would like to go get your groceries. I would like to take you to get your groceries. Offer that which is tangible help and mingle with the muddled mind. Be a little more patient, but mingle with the muddled mind. Give them more details than what you ask for. It's often well intended, but we tend to ask people about their loss and we ask them what they're going through, how they're experiencing it. We offer to give them help and then we ask them more about what they're dealing with. Can we just offer the help, mingle with the muddled mind, and give them as many details as possible? I'd like to help you with your groceries. Can I come by Tuesday morning around 10 o'clock? Work out the details and give them the option. Allow them to decide to accept it or reject it, but don't ask them to decide when's a good time. Schedules are crazy. Minds are all over the place during a time of loss. Accept emotions. Talking about loss can bring peace. But peace does not make things easier or make things bearable in the moment, in the instant, immediately. But being at peace can cause a loss of a griever to be shortened. That is to say that they can move forward as they begin to accept their own emotions. And if you'll be willing to accept their emotions too, it'll help them to move forward. Let the grieving person cry. Let the grieving person laugh. Let the grieving person be silent. And let there be long, awkward silence. Accept their emotions. Talk about triggers. An immediate change in behavior can often be a signal or a sign that a trigger has been activated. Just watch someone who's lost a loved one 
and see how they respond to maybe the sound of an ambulance or another siren. See how they respond when they're near or in a nursing home, a hospital, or a place of care. Watch someone who has lost someone enter into a church building. Those triggers can bring grief that puts the griever on autopilot. They're doing the best they can to just be where they are at that time. Talk about the triggers. If they're ready to talk, listen to them. Talk about the triggers. Talk about how you see them responding in certain situations and help them to deal with it. Listen. If the griever tries to tell you things about what they are seeing in their own life, Listen intently. But as you listen intently, you may have to read between the lines. I know of no better time than dealing with a time of loss in which an individual will say things that are extremely important to them, that are burdens upon their heart, and yet they leave saying, no one listened. Well, it's sometimes that we are listening, but we're not reading between the lines. We get the big idea, but we don't get exactly what they're trying to say. They're trying to say something without actually saying it. You're going to have to read between the lines. A griever can function perfectly normal, and sometimes this throws us off. The giver, the griever, rather, might perform well in many tasks maybe at home or at work or in their social life, among other things. They, perfunction, they function very well. Allow them to do what they can. If they can do it, allow them to do it. But be there for them. Be there to help. Be there to do it along with them. Be there for them with the things that they cannot handle in the moment. No how you respond to tears. Tears do not always illustrate pain. Knowing how you respond to tears before entering a situation where it is likely to happen will greatly help. If you know that you become a ball of mush when someone cries, you may need to give yourself some time before approaching a friend who is dealing with loss. Their tears will help them to heal. But if you become a ball of mush when they need a strong shoulder, it can make matters tough. Above all, and in all of these things, point the grieving one to God. God is the one who helps all of us through life. Even when we're not dealing with loss, when we're on the mountain peak of success and happiness and joy, God's the one who helps us through. Point the griever to God. Point people to the God of all comfort. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 3. Jeremiah Tatum wrote about this idea. He titled the article which he wrote, Winning by Losing. And I'd like to read a lengthy portion from what he wrote. He said, It occurs to me that when our Savior walked the earth, He perfected the art of winning by losing. From the humble birth to His persecution and death, and every time in between, His life was a constant series of losses. His family mocked Him and thought He was crazy when He began His ministry. He traveled long dusty roads and depended on others for his sustenance. He said, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Matthew 8 verse 20 and Luke 9 verse 58. He chose the prime years of his life to teach 12 men how to win by losing. He was ridiculed, reviled, and rebutted every day. Eventually, he was friendless, rejected by his people, and hanging on a cross as the scourge of all humanity. When others would have taken vengeance, he forgave. 
When others would have accepted praise, he retreated to seclusion. When others would have used such power to become famous, he said, tell no one. When others would have used such wisdom to promote their greatness, he simply responded with questions to cause people to grow. The little that he had in this physical realm, he shared or simply gave away. He was even willing to remain on the cross when those who were killing him challenged him to prove himself by coming down. This is Jesus who won by losing. Do you know Jesus? The gospel is the power to save man from sin. Romans chapter 1, verse number 16. And the gospel is that power to save man from sin because of Jesus, the one whom the message is about. It's about one who faced the very struggles we face. He faced the loss we face. Man is therefore invited by his message to hear the saving power, to develop faith or belief and trust in God and in Christ. Man is invited in the message of Christ to repent of sins, to confess Christ as the Son of God, be baptized, and to live faithful. It's one who has accepted those invitations, one who has been obedient to the will of God, one who is a Christian who can say the words of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3-4, through even when dealing with loss. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Come to the comfort giver if you're in need of comfort this evening. Maybe you're not in need of comfort, but you know someone who is. Reach out to them. Encourage them. Help them as best you can because there's going to come a time in which you're going to need the same. If you need comfort, come to God as we stand and as we sing.